Here's a summary of the entire physics paper one spec. There are eight energy stores you need to know about. Thermal energy stores, which increases the hotter an object gets. Chemical energy stores, which is energy released by a chemical reaction. Kinetic energy stores, which is energy that moving objects have. Gravitational potential energy stores, which increase the higher an object gets. Elastic potential energy stores, which is for any object that's stretched. Nuclear energy stores, which is released during nuclear reactions. Magnetic energy stores, which occur due to the attraction and repulsion of magnets. And electrostatic energy stores, which occur due to the attraction and repulsion of electrical charges. All these stores can be transferred from one to another in four different ways. Mechanically, when a force is applied. By heating, when energy moves from a hotter to a colder object. By electric work, when current flows in a circuit. And by radiation, when energy is transferred by a wave. Three of these energy stores have equations that you need to be familiar with. These are kinetic energy, gravitational potential energy, and elastic potential energy. Next, we have specific heat capacity, which is defined as the amount of energy required to increase the temperature of one kilogram of an object by one degree Celsius. The equation for this is energy is equal to mass times specific heat capacity times change in temperature. Power is next and is defined as the rate at which energy is transferred. This is measured in watts. Energy transferred is the same as work done, so the two equations for power can both be written as power is equal to energy transferred over time and power is equal to work done over time. Next, let's talk about efficiency. When an energy transfer takes place in an object, some of the energy is usefully transferred and some is wasted or dissipated. Efficiency is defined as the useful energy given out by an object over the total energy put into the object. And you can also write it in terms of power as useful power output over total power input. Let's move on to energy resources, which is all about ways that we generate electricity. We have non-renewable energy resources, which are the ones that will eventually run out and cannot be reused, and renewable ones that can be reused. In non-renewable resources, we have fossil fuels, which include coal, oil and gas. They are made out of remains of living organisms that died millions of years ago. They produce a lot of energy, but they also produce carbon dioxide, which is a greenhouse gas, which can lead to global warming. The other non-renewable resource is nuclear energy, which releases energy from nuclear reactions. It also produces a lot of energy and no carbon dioxide, but it does produce nuclear waste, which is expensive to dispose of. For renewable resources, most don't produce carbon dioxide and will not run out, but they have their disadvantages. Wind, which uses wind turbines, is unreliable as it's dependent on the speed of the wind. And similarly, solar energy uses solar panels and that's dependent on the sun being out, so it won't generate electricity in the nighttime, for example. Wave power also uses turbines to produce electricity, but it doesn't produce as much electricity as the others and could be dangerous to marine life. Tidal barrages use turbines that use the energy from tides going up and down. This can also kill marine life and you need a suitable location to construct these. Hydroelectric energy involves building a dam in a valley and using turbines in the dam to generate electricity. But these can only be built in limited location and they can disrupt the ecosystem by damaging animal habitats. Geothermal uses the thermal energy underground in volcanic areas to create steam that turns turbines but these can only be used in volcanic areas. And finally we have biofuels which are made from plants and waste and are burnt. These release carbon dioxide, but they're still carbon neutral as the carbon dioxide released from burning them was originally taken in by the plant during its lifetime. The next topic is all about electricity and here are every single circuit symbol that you need to know. Current is defined as the flow of electrical charge and is measured in amps. Potential difference is the energy per unit charge and it's measured in volts. It's basically the force that pushes the current around the circuit. And resistance is a property that reduces the flow of current and this is measured in ohms. There are two equations that are related to these definitions and these are Q equals IT and V equals IR. Next up we have IV graphs which show how current changes with potential difference. The three IV graphs you need to know about are the ones for an ohmic conductor which is a straight line through the origin, a filament lamp which has an S-shaped curve as the lamp gets hot and its resistance increases, and a diode where the current is at zero in the negative axis and goes up in the positive axis. That's just because diodes only allow current to flow in one direction, which is the positive direction. Other graphs include the one for light dependent resistors where their resistance decreases as the light intensity of the surroundings increase. Similarly, we have thermistors, but these decrease their resistance when temperature of the surroundings increase. Circuits can be one of two types. Series circuits where all the components are on one loop and parallel circuits when they're on different loops. 
In series circuits, current is the same everywhere and the potential difference is shared between the components, whereas in parallel circuits, potential difference is the same on each branch and current splits at each branch. Resistance increases as you add more resistors in series, but it decreases when you add them in parallel. For domestic electricity, you need to know the differences between direct current, which flows in one direction, and alternating current, which always changes in direction. Alternating current is used in the UK main supply, which is 230 volts and 50 hertz. The plugs used in mains electricity contain a three core cable made up of a brown live wire, which carries 230 volts, a blue neutral wire, which completes the circuit, and a green and yellow earth wire which is for safety. The earth wire is just used when you have a fault where the live wire comes in contact with the metal casing of an appliance. Power is the rate at which energy is transferred and electrical power can be found using these three equations. The final part of this topic is all about the national grid where electricity leaves the power station and passes through a step up transformer where its potential difference is increased so that less energy is lost due to heat in the cables. It is then distributed around the country and goes through a step down transformer for safety before reaching your home. Here's an equation for transformers that helps you work out the current and potential difference going in and out of a transformer. The third topic starts with density where the equation is mass over volume and you can find the volume of an object by using a eureka can and measuring the water displaced by it. You can then divide mass by that volume and you can find the density of the object. You also need to know how density changes in solids, liquids and gases and how the particles are arranged in each one. Solids have close particles with a regular structure, liquids also have close particles but the structure is irregular and gases have particles which are far apart that move quickly in random directions. In a gas the particles collide with each other and the walls of the container. This creates a pressure on the container and as temperature increases, the speed of the particles increase and this can cause the gas particles to hit the walls of the container more often and with a greater force which creates more pressure. Next we have changes in states where going from a solid to liquid is known as melting and the reverse process is called freezing. Then going from liquid to gas is known as boiling and the reverse process of that is known as condensing. This is all to do with the changes in internal energy, where internal energy is the sum of the kinetic and potential energies of particles in a system. The internal energy of a system increases as it's heated, and so when it goes from a solid to a liquid to a gas, it also increases. The energy required to change the state of an object is known as the latent heat, and specific latent heat is defined as the amount of energy required to change the state of one kilogram of a substance with no change in temperature. You can have latent heat of fusion which is for when a solid turns into a liquid and latent heat of vaporization when a liquid turns into a gas. When these state changes are happening the temperature of the substance stays the same and this is shown in their heating and cooling graphs. These have flat bits because when you're changing the state of the object the temperature doesn't change. The energy supplied to it is used to break the bonds in the substance rather than increasing the temperature of the substance. Topic 4 is an atomic structure. The model of what we think an atom is has changed a lot throughout history. John Dalton said that atoms were spheres where each element had a specific type of atom. JJ Thompson then discovered the electron and came up with a plum pudding model where electrons were embedded within a positive sphere. Ernst Rutherford then discovered the nucleus by carrying out the alpha particle scattering experiment where he found that alpha particles mostly passed straight through a piece of gold foil while a few were deflected. Then Niels Bohr discovered the proton and said that electrons orbited the nucleus at fixed distances known as shells. And finally James Chadwick then discovered the neutron which led to the structure of the atom that we use today. In this structure we have an atom made up of protons, neutrons and electrons and these are the masses and charges of them. Protons and neutrons are found in the nucleus of an atom and the electrons orbit the nucleus in shells or energy levels. These electrons can go up energy levels by absorbing electromagnetic radiation and they can also go down by emitting electromagnetic radiation. Nuclear symbols for elements can show you the mass number which gives you the number of protons and neutrons and the atomic number which can give you the number of protons. Isotopes are atoms of an element with the same number of protons but a different number of neutrons. Some isotopes are stable but others are unstable and they become stable by giving off radiation. This is known as radioactive decay and it's a random process. Radioactive decay is measured using a Geiger Muller tube and it's measured in Becquerels. There are three types of radiation that you can have. Alpha which is a helium nucleus, beta which is an electron and gamma which is an electromagnetic wave. 
Alpha has a high ionizing power which means it can remove electrons from an atom easily but it has a low penetrating power which means it can't pass through many materials. It's stopped by paper, skin and a few centimeters of air. Beta has a moderate ionizing and penetrating power and can be stopped by aluminium. Gamma on the other hand has the lowest ionizing power but has the highest penetrating power and is only stopped by thick lead or concrete. The half-life of a material is the time it takes for the number of undecayed nuclei to half. In a graph you can find the half-life by drawing a line at half of the initial activity. You draw this up to the curve and then you extend it downwards and read what the time says. And finally we have contamination and irradiation which are two different ways that object can be exposed to ionizing radiation. Contamination is when a radioactive particle comes into direct contact with a material or object whereas irradiation is when an object is just exposed to the radiation given off by the radioactive particles. Alpha radiation poses the greatest contamination risk because it's the most ionizing but the least irradiation risk. This is because it can't travel far in air. Whereas gamma poses the greatest irradiation risk and the lowest contamination risk.